Robin, am I? Hello, folks, and welcome to uh, Jumpstart. Today, we are talking um, from 9 to 9.30 about the ACE framework, which is a bit of a framework that the CoLab uses when we're talking about teaching and learning um, during challenging times or times of crisis, um, and also a framework that's consistent with how we approach pedagogy sort of generally. Uh, at 9.30, we will transition to our amazing guest speaker, Bonnie Stewart, who I will be introducing in a little bit. Um, and then just to remind you from um, 10.30 to 11, uh, Bonnie will take off, but Martha and Hannah and I will stay here and do a debriefing chat about whatever is on your minds. Um, so with that, I am actually going to share my screen. And close that up and move this. I'm signed in as my daughter. That's always professional. All right. Um, so I will ask uh, Hannah or somebody to throw the ACE um, link into the chat there so that if anybody hasn't seen ACE before, you can do that. Um, and, and uh, explore it in your own time or even during this presentation. Uh, but the framework is an educator created guide, meaning basically we put this together in the collab, primarily Martha and I, uh, but we used a lot of um, resources that are out there on the web, many of them openly licensed. And we were really intentional about using resources that were mostly created by and for educators. So uh, teachers, K-12 teachers, professors, people who are actually um, in the classroom or people who directly support those people like instructional designers, technologists, and librarians. Um, we did this particularly because at the beginning of COVID, there was a lot of support coming very quickly uh, from companies who were offering technology tools. Um, you may or may not know that in this country, uh, in the United States, the ed tech industry is a $19 billion industry. Um, and that industry was really effective at responding quickly to the challenges of COVID by offering um, people uh, tools, sometimes for free. Uh, of course, those free tools would, would turn out to be tools you had to pay for in another six months. Um, and some of those tools were helpful, Zoom being one of them, we're using it now. Um, and uh, the, you, the national use of Zoom surged uh, after the, the pandemic. Um, but Martha and I were really concerned that sometimes the adoption of these technology tools were driven more by the industry than by the needs of learners. So that's why we developed the ACE framework to think about curriculum delivery during times of crisis in a way that's really focused on students. ACE stands for adaptability, connection, and equity, and those are the values that we centered our plan on. Um, those values were developed particularly because they were consistent with um, two missions that are important to us. One was the mission uh, of Plymouth State University. So if you look at the mission of Plymouth State, you will see it sort of referencing um, some of these values. And then also our value, as, particularly as a public institution. So we felt like uh, we have a, uh, we're in service to the public good and also to public higher education. So that's where ACE came from. Um, and we focused around these three things. Um, thinking about adaptability is I think an, an obvious value to center during a time of crisis like a pandemic. Everybody knew immediately that the main thing we had to do as professors um, was to adapt. We had to adapt um, our expectations. We had to adapt our curriculum. We had to adapt our modalities. Uh, so the idea that we had to be adaptable and maybe more flexible seemed like the key reason why we had to develop a new framework. But we also wanted to be cognizant of the fact that when many people were moving um, either completely online or large chunks of previously face-to-face -face, uh, uh, 
coursework to online environments, one thing that happened, especially when people were trying to be more asynchronous because it was really challenging for some of our students to connect at particular times um, through, their, through their technology. One of the things that happened is that uh, a lot of curriculum seemed to move towards these more individualized competency-based models. So what I mean by that, and my, my daughter's very familiar with this because she takes a lot of courses through our virtual learning academy now, um, which is the online school for K-12 in New Hampshire. And what you see in these online uh, sort of courses that are designed with all of the best practices of online learning from the quality matters perspective. So sort of um, key universal best practices for online design. Everything's very clear, it's very standardized, but it's also very individual. So she moves through the content one thing at a time at her own pace. Um, she can redo things until she gains competency in a certain area. This is really great, it's low pressure. It allows her to be massively flexible with how she approaches learning. But one thing she doesn't have is connection to anything. Um, she sees her instructor usually uh, maybe every three to four weeks for a check-in. She has uh, one collaboration per semester usually with other learners in the course. Um, and for the most part, she's just working in isolation. Um, that makes sense for certain kinds of learning at certain kinds of time. For example, I'm taking a course right now um, that is designed that way and it's perfect for what that course is about and what I need. Um, but during a global pandemic, for students who expect it to be, for example, residential college students, it can be really alienating and isolating to lose the connection that you may have come to college seeking. Um, so we wanted to design environments that really centered human connection in online spaces. And then finally, equity. I think uh, when COVID hit at Plymouth State, we were not immediately facing the ramifications of the virus as much as the economic fallout of the virus, people immediately losing jobs, students going home to environments that were rural or poor, where they didn't have access to broadband. Um, so some of those equity issues really smacked faculty in the face. So even if you weren't someone before who had been doing things with open educational resources or with basic needs on campus, you suddenly realize that if you weren't prepared to deal with those things in your class, you were probably gonna have a large number of students just fall off the map. So that's why we selected adaptability, connection and equity. Um, as the cornerstones for ACE when we were building. Um, and the ACE framework, which can look a little complicated when you first see it, um, but once you get used to using the site, uh, it becomes easier. The first two, um, two rows of these ACE-informed practices are assignment level practices that are for faculty in particular, um, especially as supported by instructional designers who want to find ways to be more adaptable or connected or equitable in their assignment designs. The second two rows are the course level. So when you're making decisions about your syllabus and how to organize your course, um, how can you be more adaptable, connected and equitable? And then the last two rows are specifically institutional. So these are less for faculty and instructional designers and librarians and more for faculty committees, um, provosts, uh, IT teams. These are for people who are making institutional level decisions um, because the idea here is that if we, if we do more with alignment, um, we may have more large scale success with emergency remote teaching um, than we would otherwise. So if our assignments and our courses, of course, we want to align those things to things like our learning outcomes, but we want our learning outcomes to be aligned to our institutional missions. We want our institutional policies and practices to support individual faculty practices. So um, if you, for example, are transitioning uh, to more flexible uh, grading models, what institutional practices can accompany that? We saw during the first um, leg of the pandemic that many institutions, including Plymouth, 
move to optional pass fail grading. So those are the kinds of things that you'll see at the institution level. They are less about um, design and more about the kinds of questions that institutions should be asking themselves in order to guide their decision making processes. So if you use the ACE framework, you'll come to this page of practices and you'll be able to click inside of each one, find some techniques and some approaches for working on them. So for example, at the assignment level, what we're really looking at is how can an assignment increase the fit between a course and a student's life? Um, how can an assignment connect students to each other and to their communities of practice, knowing that they're dealing with um, isolation and um, loneliness uh, and mental health challenges, um, social distancing? Are there ways that assignments can be used um, to respond to those kinds of crises? So you're sort of doing two pieces of work there, right? You're using your course not only to deliver content, but also to respond to the particular context of the coronavirus crisis. Um, and in terms of equity, how can assignments be shaped to include more learners more fully? Um, that can be everything from making sure that your um, assignments are built um, in ways that allow students to connect at different times. Um, so that's about being uh, thoughtful about asynchronous options in your assignments, but also things like accessibility. Um, so when you design your assignments, how can you think about um, ways that students with low vision or, or low hearing could um, participate? What ways might you design your assignments so that dyslexic students aren't um, uh, overly penalized for the fact that it might take them much, much longer to read or write something. So all of these pieces are the assignment level. The uh, second set of levels of practices is really about courses. And we've spent time in, a, in um, Jumpstart over the last few days really looking at the adaptability part of this. So um, on Monday, we talked about um, not so much high flex design, but highly flexible designs, uh, event-based planning for thinking about how your course delivery could be responsive to the fact that students are learning in very different ways now. They can't all cram into a classroom. Um, their schedules have been upset. Their um, environments for learning are changed. Uh, and how can course design connect students to their academic communities? Um, this is really what you're going to get at 930 today because um, Bonnie Stewart, who we're going to be hearing from, really looks at that center column of ACE, that connection center. And what she's really adept at doing is thinking about how assignments, courses, and institutions um, can really deliver human-centered learning. And particularly in online environments where many of us, um, regardless of what we think about online learning, have really struggled to feel like there is as much human connection as there was when, um, when we might have taught face-to-face. -face. Um, so that is the uh, center level there, the um, course level. The institution level will spend a little less time talking about, but the main thing I want to say here is that um, what we really want you to be doing in your assignment and your course design um, is to be working with rather than in spite of or against your institution. So if you are doing something, it's going to be challenging because of the global pandemic. We want our institution to be supporting us in ways as we adapt um, we want the institution to support us to make those adaptations that we make um, consistent with larger institutional messaging and structures. Um, so if we are, for example, moving online uh, to do various kinds of online learning for coronavirus, we need to make sure our institution is not only providing the um, access that we need as faculty um, and the technologies that we need to connect, um, but also how is the institution dealing with the fact that some of our students may not have working devices um, or a broadband connection. Those are things um, that individual faculty need to be cognizant of, but that our institutions are really better equipped to handle on a larger scale. 
Um, before I throw it to you guys for <coughs> a, um, maybe a little bit of contributing here, I just want to say I was I was doing a little research into the etymology of the word pandemic, and it's probably no surprise that it comes uh, from the Greek pandemos, meaning of all the people. Um, I've been thinking about this lately when I'm thinking about the public coronavirus response and the role of a public institution in a coronavirus response. Our institution at Plymouth um, you know, has basically a field hospital. Um, we've been doing testing. Um, these feel like public health responses that a public institution was, was sort of well equipped to put into place. Um, in the public health response for coronavirus, you can't hoard all of the um, antibacterial soap and hand sanitizer, because if other people aren't cleaning their hands, you are going to be more likely to get coronavirus. So in a pandemic, all of the people have to understand their public connection to each other in order to solve the problem. Um, it makes me feel, <coughs> excuse me, I think hopeful to be at a public institution at this time, because I feel like it's part of my mission, not just to make sure an individual student gets their individual content, but to think of a pandemic appropriate response with my curriculum. My curriculum in a, in a global pandemic doesn't just have to deliver content to one student who is getting an individual consumer good of a, of a education. My, content needs to be delivered in a way um, that all of the people benefit from the delivery of that content when all the people have a, such a, an overwhelming need. So that can lead us to thinking about some of the ways that um, coronavirus itself can be part of our curriculum um, as well as part of our uh, methodology when we are teaching. So lots of the folks who are in with us today are people who are um, what we've come to term ACE practitioners. Even if they've only taken one little idea from the ACE framework, um, or they've sort of tried to adopt a mindset of being more adaptable, connected, or equitable in their teaching. Um, these are folks who have been through workshops with us um, or, uh, or individual sessions. So I thought we might just spend a couple of minutes before we turn it over to Bonnie asking some of the questions related to adaptability, connection, and equity. Um, what have you done that has made your course more flexible or adaptable? What have you done that with your assignments or your courses that have really built some connections between you and your students or between your students and each other? or importantly, between your students and their communities. Um, community connection is so much more challenging when you're basically told all the time, please stay away from your community, please stay in your house. Um, or what changes did you make um, at an assignment or a course level to make uh, your learning environments more equitable? And then relatedly, has your institution done anything that you feel like, wow, that, that really supported me in making uh, learning more adaptable, connected, or equitable for my students. And I'm very grateful for my institution for providing this. Um, so I will show you the last slide, uh, which is just the connection part of ACE. And to remind you that where we're going next, Bonnie Stewart, I always think when I think of her, of the um, quote from Forrester, only connect. Um, if there's anything I've learned from Bonnie over the years, it's that, uh, that human connection if it is the foundation from which we build our educational environments, our educational vi environments will thrive so much more. Um, so before we turn it over to Bonnie, let me just ask um, either for the chat or for uh, talking, you know, just unmuting and chiming in, are there things that you particularly pulled away from ACE um, and adapted for your own use that you're like, you know, that one small thing really made a difference in, in my course or my approach this semester. And I know there's stuff in the chat, but I'd also like to ask people just unmute and, um, and jump in if you've got anything. Okay, I'll speak up. This is Marianne. I put it in the chat, but there's typos. So I thought I would speak. Um, 
so last spring, because I've been on sabbatical this fall, not teaching, but last spring when we had to pivot um, in my environmental science and policy class, they had a, a big document about identifying the five um, environmental uh, legislative acts through history of and uh, develop a paper on why those were the most significant and what were the relationships between those policies. That paper was due before the end of the semester. And so I, I could read those. And then I took what I thought were just really stellar lines and I created a new document and I inserted those lines with people's names. And then I made a PowerPoint. And then the last, one of the last classes, I read through that. So, and I annotated as I was going. And I, um, so I celebrated each student in that way, in a positive way. And then they could all see um, their different perspectives and views. And I think it really worked. That's fantastic. It's also a certain kind of adaptability, right? It's not just about adapting a modality. It's also about adapting to the things that are organically happening in your class. Um, and we've talked about this a lot through the cluster pedagogy learning community at Plymouth. But um, a, lot of, a lot of that emergence is a way of being adaptable, right? So that when you're taking things that your students are offering and building that into your course as you go, you know you're going to alienate your students less, right? Because your students are telling you where they are and you're using that to build parts of your courses. So that, that emergence, even though it can be challenging, we've been talking the last few days in Jumpstart about like, planning becomes really important when you're managing all the pieces that we're managing right now. But that kind of emergence is a sort of planning that allows you to stay connected to your students. Um, and you know you won't leave them behind if part of what you're doing is designing around their um, experiences and reactions to your course. Um, anyone else wanna unmute and say something? Say something. I'll jump in. Um, so I was teaching a first year class asynchronously online, never ideal. Um, many of the students were not on campus, they were still at home. So I, I thought a lot about, I've taught asynchronously online in the past quite a bit, and what it ends up feeling like is you're teaching a bunch of individual enrollments because there's not a lot of connection between the students. And the particular class I was teaching is a project-based class. They have to collaborate with each other. So I moved all of the collaboration activities from Moodle, our learning management system to Teams. And it wasn't perfect by any means, but it was so much better than you know, having discussion forums or having, trying to find mechanisms for the students to collaborate with each other in a tool like Moodle, which is not designed for that. Teams is very much like Slack. Um, it's not ideal. There's definitely problems, but it's more, it's got more of those kind of um, easy to use instantaneous communication features to it. And for some, of the groups in, in the class, they worked really, really well together, which, which I think is a testament to the tool. Um, and, and I mean, especially because some of the groups that worked really, really well together, like they actually became friends. That's what they said in their end of semester reflection. So I, I, I don't know, I think it was moderately successful. <laughs> Everybody here is moderately successful now. And they're like, oh my God, <laughs> like she, she had moderate success. That's amazing. Um, yeah, and I wanna put in a plug that at January Jamboree, um, which is Plymouth State's professional development uh, series in uh, over the winter, we are gonna have some sessions where um, different folks are gonna walk you through some of the environments that were moderately successful for, um, for building uh, these kind of rapports with students. So the two that I'm thinking of offhand, Kathy's gonna be part of a series um, with a couple of other folks that are gonna be looking at 
launching through the learning management system, but building a course environment that's um, clear for students um, and that's functional. And uh, Kathy will show you some of how she set up also her learning management system, which has worked really well for her. Um, and then Kayla uh, Godat is also going to walk through um, her environment, which uses, as Kathy is talking about here, um, the Teams environment integrated with this. Now, for those of you who aren't at Plymouth State, no worries, um, because all of the January Jamboree stuff will be recorded and available as recordings afterwards. So you, you can't come into those just because of how we're handling the security on that. Um, but all of that stuff will be posted, you know, within a few days of, of running those sessions. Um, so I think with that, if you've got more stuff, by all means, uh, pop it into the um, into the chat as we go, because even little tiny techniques that you tried uh, were, are great. And also, I just want to say hello this morning, because some of my very dearest colleagues from our other institutions who I don't get much of a chance to see, like on my screen right now, I have um, Siobhan and Fitney and Karen, and like these are just um, superstars in my world. And I really want, if nothing else, for all of you guys to start to recognize each other um, and talk with each other, because these are some absolutely amazing um, people. Oh, and there's uh, Catherine, who I'm also just getting to know. So it's very exciting. Um, yes, and Becky, okay, I can't, this is like romper room now where I'm just calling you out separately. <laughs> it's kind of, there's a whole other screen. I can't see the rest of you. I'm sure you're amazing too. Um, so hello and thanks for coming. Uh, I am going to stop the recording. Hold on a second.